All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have with us the director of the American Institute of Pyramid Research, Larry Paul. How are you today, Mr. Paul? Hey, I'm doing great. Glad to be with you, Brandon. This is so cool. I've been looking at your work, man. You have a wonderful YouTube. I will link, of course, all of the ways to find you down in the show notes here so everybody can take a look at and get as excited about your research as I have been. So tell me a little bit about yourself, and then we'll launch into the to the meaty stuff, man. Well, I... Uh basically have a, a teaching background, but you know, when I was teaching, I would tell my high school and my college students, I taught both at the high school and college level, uh, and they would inevitably start laughing when I talked about another job I had, because I, I do not have a straight line resume. I've done, I've been a, a carpenter, a mason, a, a bouncer at a bar, you know, I've, I've been a corporate, uh, uh, almost vice president. I was director of marketing for a major corporation. I've sold stocks and bonds, you know, it goes on and on. It's, un it's hard to believe, you know, you, you could pack this much in and they'd always laugh. So, so, you know, to, to bypass that long list of things, you know, it's like once like 37 jobs I held or something. And, and, and again, you'd think a guy's a ne'er do well with, with a resume like that, you got fired from, I, I could have positive references from almost everybody. So it's just my life worked out that way. And so, uh, you know, the, the teaching, uh, when I basically retired from that, I went into what I've always been doing. I've, I've uh, back in the infancy of the internet, I had a million hits on my page about the Great Pyramid. I have greatpyramid.org. I have greatpyramid.us. I have these top level domain names because I was early on, I was like the only guy in the Great Pyramid in the very beginning. Then I left it to do my teaching career, basically, have come back to it. And the internet changed radically in the 20 years I did a lot of teaching and stuff. But I, I put my, myself fully, uh, the same way I did into my teaching, into what had been my avocation the whole time I was teaching, which is the Great Pyramid in ancient Egypt. So now I'm, uh, you know, when I was teaching, I was always teaching someone else's curriculum. I taught political science at the college level. I was a social studies and history teacher at the high school level. So I was always teaching somebody else's curriculum. And I, well, I enjoyed the stuff I taught. Now I'm really into, I've, I've hit the stride of my life, the fulfillment of my calling. I'm, I'm studying daily, uh, full-time, leading tours, uh, doing research in Egypt and uh, the mysteries of ancient Egypt. So that's me. <laughs> this is so cool. And I'll link how to find uh, how to book a tour with you. My wife and I are going to join you on one of those one time, I promise. So be great, uh, yeah. with your well-rounded background, though, it sounds like it's all of it's played a bit of a role into how you approach the work. If nothing else, the work ethic required to obtain the skills that you had before your calling or your true work that you're doing now. I think it's also interesting that you were a carpenter. I do a little woodworking myself. Um, and the masonry work that you did as well. How much of the lens of your physical working with your hands background do you apply to how you view the way that the pyramids were constructed you know uh the the thing that i learned i, I mark laner was sitting in the session of uh, dr doug inglis he was getting a phd and he was making a presentation at rc to a filled audience about his findings for fourth dynasty boat building so he's presenting slides about the bottom for instance of the Kushu, khufu ship which just yesterday as you probably saw was I moved. saw that it was beautiful. home in Giza to its new site at the gym. And they made, you know, a big procession out of that. So, uh, you know, he was talking about that vessel and other vessels from the fourth dynasty. And he showed how the, the wood was put together like a jigsaw puzzle, not like going to Home Depot and buying two by fours and building a modular boat. This was handcrafted. And Mark Lehner stood up at the question and answer session, never had met Dr. Doug Ingus before, and said, what you are finding about Fourth Dynasty boats is the same thing I've been finding for 40 years about the masonry of the pyramids at Giza. So, so Mark Lehner was saying, I've noticed by all my study, 40 years, no man has studied the Giza Plateau more than him, that he's seen the hand of craftsmen, Egyptian craftsmen. One of the questions that was asked of Doug Inglis when I heard him give a different presentation at the uh, uh, Oriental Institute, the greatest stash of, our, of Egyptology in America, basically, at, at the University of Chicago, I heard him give a talk there, and an engineer asked him a question after he talked about Fourth Dynasty boat building. He said, were there schools of engineering in ancient Egypt? And Dr. Doug Inglis said, no, father taught son. So think about that. You can study four years at a university here in America, learn a lot of things, but how much more could you learn if your father and his father before him and his father before him worked with it every day and they taught you and they taught you and they taught you. And so a tremendous, that made me realize hearing Doug Inglis give that answer to that engineer's question, 
the tremendous uh, knowledge you could gain, the hands-on knowledge of how to do things. And I see that all over Giza. It's one of the things I use to argue against the, the alternatives who insist, you know, that it couldn't have been done. That They had a tremendous artisan skill in rope making, in stone making, in engineering water, you know, irrigating fields. They just show tremendous, uh, uh, you know, uh, hands-on intelligence. I like the wisdom that's involved in these kind of things getting passed down because you look at this with tanning hides or something with the Native American traditions, with uh, bead making, with things like tool making, things like this. These are crafts that are handed down. Now, there's a couple schools of thought on this as well. And like I said, I definitely want to get into alternative theories with you. One of them would be that um, that they were so abundant that you can only do this. The Gobekli Tepe argument that they could only build such a thing if they had architecture or agriculture, if they had a well to do society where they had time to spend on this. If you're not trying to survive constantly, then you have time to learn these skills and right. then to pass them on and to create right. these incredible monoliths that we see. I also want to yeah. talk to you about high uh, civilization. I've got so many questions for you, I'll be honest. So, uh, but if you don't mind, let's let's launch into some of your work here. So the, the, the horse's uh, foot is in what's called the trench. It's sometimes called the third trial passages, the third trial passage by Egyptologists. Okay, so 14 royal cubits to its west uh, are, there's the entrance to the trial passages. There's the well shaft of the trial passages, and here's the exit. Now, here's what entrance and exit are. The trial passages are an exact replica of the passages 100 yards to the east in the Great Pyramid. Egyptologists believe these were the, the trial passages were built by the Flinders Petri believed that it was built by the same people that built the Great Pyramid. So just like if you if you're standing on the east side of the Great Pyramid, Brandon, you just mentioned how massive it is. You're looking at it. Where do you find the key when you're looking at a big map of the world? You find the key in the lower right. That's exactly where the trial passages are. They are a key. The builders left the key to the Great Pyramid, one of many. And so the entrance to the trial passage is an exact replica of the entrance to the Great Pyramid, 100 yards to the, to the, uh, to the, to the, to the west, because the trial passages are 100 yards to the east. I've been at the uh, you know, you can't, they, they now have a law, it's uh, 30 days in jail minimum if you climb the pyramid. Yeah. Well, I, like a lot of people have climbed up to the original entrance, they blow the whistle on the ground, they tell you to come down. Now you don't want to do it, it's really dangerous. But I got permission from the director of the pyramids, uh, Ashraf, to climb up there one time. And I was there recently when I had private a private entrance to the Great Pyramid. And so I've been up there. And again, the trial passages are a replica of that original entrance at the 19th course. And the exit point is, is where the, the, the passages inside the Great Pyramid go into the Grand Gallery. If you look at the trial passage exit, they're an exact mimic of the Grand Gallery in the Great Pyramid. So here on the Giza Plateau, where you don't have to go inside the pyramid, climb up, is a replica. The, the passages are the same size. They're just shortened by one-fifth. So there are one fifth replica in another way. There are life size replica in width and height in the other way. And so I have I made a presentation at a huge Egyptological conference about my work uh, studying uh, the trial passages, just showing what ways they could be a key. As a matter of fact, uh, I published uh, a YouTube video today. Uh, let me just show parts of that parts of the presentation I made there. So. Uh, the YouTube video I today I published today about uh, the Great Pyramid shows uh, you know where the trial passages are. But what I show about it is that uh, here's here's the view right here. So you can see that the uh, let me just show this here the trial passages in the trench. There's the trial passages. There's the trench that I showed you called the third trial passage. It's an exact mimic of the central line of the Great Pyramid and the line that the passages are in, the first ascending passage, the Grand Gallery. And so if you move those over, you would have the Great Pyramid laid out over the top of the trial passages. In other words, the, again, it's just showing the trial passages are an exact mimic of, of uh, the Great Pyramid. So I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen there now. So, so one of the things, uh, uh, Mark Foster has done some work on this. Okay, we know that Al Mamun chopped into the Great Pyramid in the year 820 AD. That's the entrance everybody goes into today. Nobody goes in the original entrance. It's too narrow. It's small. It, it's closed off. You can't get. So it's this big gash into the Great Pyramid that goes directly into the passage system. 
Well, people never stop to ask, well, how did El Mamoun just happen to go exactly to the one point that's going to lead him up to the ground? Well, Mark Foster says you, you could anciently get down and go up through the well shaft and find what was in the king's chamber. But if you found something big, like the, the lid of the sarcophagus, which is not there, it wouldn't fit back through the, tri through the well shaft. Oh, but if you went down and chopped your way out, straight out. And so Mark Foster says El Mamoun's passage wasn't shot by him in 820 going in because his spies found a thing they could get out. The sarcophagus was too big to get out, but the lid, which is not up in the king's chamber, mm -hmm. he says they chiseled out. And so that the passage that everyone now goes into the Great Pyramid in the, the, uh, the El Mamoun entrance on, I think, the ninth course was constructed by going out, not by going in. And, and, and Mark Foster says that El Mamoun probably knew about the trial passages. There's a scored line in the trial passages that's also in the Great Pyramid. Those that have studied the pyramid know that this, in the, in the uh, entrance passage, the beginning of the descending passage, is a scored line, a very distinct scored line that some say pointed to the Pleiades at the time that the pyramid was built. And that scored line is in the trial passages too. So Mark Foster says El Mamoun measured how far it was in the trial passages then extrapolated by the scale. And that's how he knew where to go in, in, in terms of finding exactly where that point was. So the trial passages are a key that way to the Great Pyramid. The thing that I added today in the video that I did, besides the trial passages being key to the Great Pyramid in ways like I just said, there's other ways besides the one I just gave. I, uh, the last time I was there, I did what's become one of the things that's my trademark of research now the lines that are on the plateau, because I've had some hassle from the Egyptian authorities up in the pyramid. I thought, you know, they've taken film from me before and stuff. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the real Indiana Jones. I'm not a fictional character. And so I thought, you know, they let me do things on the Giza plateau. Well, there's all kinds of markings on the Giza plateau that were put there by the same people that built the great pyramid. So I started to study the lines on the great pyramid and realized there's a language there. And so uh, the, the, uh, some of the some of the lines there have, have shown me all all kinds of things and uh and so uh what i what i did was i did the same thing to the trial passages there are some lines through the trial passages let me uh uh i'll just show you yeah. uh when you can see that we don't show on the screen but the point is if you look at the trial pass you see there's cut some cuts across this, across it the same way i see cuts all through the giza plateau all i did was simply measure those I measured those cuts and the angle. Then I simply went home to Google Earth and put the angles I had found in the trial passages. And what I found, it's unbelievable. It points to the, to the southwest border of the Menkara Pyramid. It points to the southeast corner of the Khafre Pyramid. It points to the southeast corner of the Mortuary Temple of Khafre's Pyramid. And it points to the Lahoon Pyramid, the 12th dynasty Renaissance pyramid that's down in the Fayum Oasis, it points directly to that. And so these pointings would just seem to be these random marks that are on the trial passages. It's showing me the trial passages are a key, not just, not just to the Great Pyramid, it's a key to larger Giza. And, and what I end my YouTube video with today is you've got to explain the unitary construction that's at Giza. This is not three competing pharaohs. My pyramid's bigger than your pyramid. Because the whole history of the world is that. Napoleon, you know, the, the Caesars, the whole history of the world is, you know, Trump is, is the, the leaders, you know, being, fighting everybody else. You know, what's the chances of Trump getting along with Clinton, you know, or Obama? It's not going to happen. Well, look at these pharaohs. These pyramids are all in unison. Yeah. This is not the normal story of the world of of uh, incredibly ambitious pharaohs battling each other. My pyramid is bigger than yours. There's a tremendous unity here. And the trial passages showed me that by pointing, I never knew this before, not just to the Great Pyramid, to the whole Giza Plateau, and even down to Lahoon. Yeah, Something's yeah. going on that needs greater explanation. God, I love your work. You're fascinating. I just have to say that I, I love everything about this. And yes, you have to look at it like, well, you know, Kufur's brother didn't want to build, wanted to build this on ostentatious type gaudy thing. But everybody was like, no, 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 man, toe the line. Let's let's keep it uniform. Let's keep it. It's it's almost like they had like um, an HOA or something back then, you know, kind of like a, a standard <laughs> in which like if you leave your trash cans out, if you build your pyramid different, you get fined. So uh, I, I love that. 
the, the I learned by by presenting at Egyptological conferences, I really don't hover around, you know, the traditionalists. But to me, I'm doing what well, all you other alternatives. Why don't you do what I did? Why don't you pr- why don't you write a paper and submit it to Egyptologists? If you're because you're always talking about the mainstream doesn't accept this. Well, publish something that's legitimate so that they they have something to look at. So I did that. And when I went to these Egyptological conferences, now I'm in a group of people I'm not normally with, Egyptologists. I learned about their culture by listening. And one thing I learned, it was a guy from the University of Chicago was talking about what they called the Giza exception. The things you're talking about are this ordered system of tombs, the Eastern field, the Western field on Giza. You have a type of HOA, like you talked about, that doesn't exist other places. Yeah. They called it the Khufu exception. So that taught me a lot without studying Egyptology, knowing that, that they called it the Khufu exception, that what we see at Giza is not the normal thing you find in Egypt, but it is there. It is there. Because what you find elsewhere is probably more, I my pyramid's bigger than your pyramid. It's the old ancient thing that's the history of the world, you know, ambitious kings fighting ambitious kings. But you've got the Khufu exception. It's so interesting, man. And I, like I said, I, I want to get into some alternate history, alternative history stuff with you and how uniform it seems that a global civilization was, but let's, let's save that for just a minute. I, I also like how you're utilizing technology to discover new things about the pyramids that we did not know before, the interconnectivity of Giza and everything else around it. Uh, you also find this with uh, LIDAR and where they're using laser radar over the Amazon to discover undiscovered entire complexes of Mayan tombs and cities. It, it's fascinating to me, the integration of these two things, especially how you go down on the field, make measurements, angles and everything, because those angles would just scale, you know, they, they're scalable. So whenever you go home and use technology to find this, it's fascinating to me. And you're yeah. making new discoveries out of modern technology from something ancient that there are such massive controversies and mysteries surrounding just the existence of the pyramids, the Great Pyramids especially, but then the complex that's found globally. I mean, you talk about the things that are found in the Amazon as well, pyramids, Teotihuacan, Peru, Cusco, uh, and the way that you talked about the shipbuilding, uh, that is also another thing that you find with stones in the Amazon as well. Uh, Again, in Peru, you find these, they look like the blocks have been melted and poured into place. The angles and the way that they make these things, it's incredible to me. And not a lot of people do know about the uniform construction or kind of the interlockingness about the bricks or the blocks used in the Great Pyramid as well. Do you mind just talking a little bit about how they fit together? How would they have constructed something so huge like that? Well, you know, I'm going to actually answer this from the angle you weren't expecting. Because uh, I just recently watched a video uh, of, a, of a German video of a guy who climbed the pyramid in eight minutes. Uh, people don't realize, you know, the, uh, the slope angle of the Great Pyramid is 51 degrees, but the Eris angle on the edge is 42 degrees. So if you're smart, you climb on the edge because it's a, it's a low, much, it's, you know, 10 degree less angle. And so he, he climbed on the edge. He probably knew that. And, and uh, so he's got a GoPro on, obviously, because the footage, you're hearing him breathe, but you don't see him. You see the stones as he's going up. And it reminded me as he was near the top that Flinders Petrie said, you know, the top third or, or more of the Great Pyramid is sloppy work. And uh, he thought maybe there was a different, uh, you know, taskmaster, a different uh, architect or engineer that, that took over for the work. And uh, Peter James wrote a book, I think, called Saving the Pyramids. He's the guy the Egyptian government hired to renovate the pyramids, like the Step Pyramid, you know, for years had the scaffolding on it. Now it's this pristine, beautiful thing. And you don't see the scaffolding. Peter James is the guy behind that. So Peter James has an inside look at the pyramids more than anybody else because he's the one renovating them. And in his book, Saving the Pyramids, he talks about basically, you know, that, you know, you can conclude how they built it. It's not what everybody thinks. There's a lot of fill probably in the Great Pyramid. They did a real good job of making the outside tight, but then there was a lot of inner fill and stuff. And the, the fact that the top, since there doesn't seem to be anything of importance at the top, uh, there's probably some hidden passages where the void is, but that there's still a whole bunch of the pyramid above that. So they didn't have to be as good. They, you know, the point I think part of the Great Pyramid being built so big was if they had the intelligence, they could have left this in a little crystal chip this big, all the revelation that's in the Great Pyramid. They could have put into a, you know, much smaller than, than a, uh, you know, a, a memory stick you stick in a computer. They could have put all the knowledge at the Great Pyramid. Everybody says, it's so amazing. How did they do that? They could have given it to us that way. Why didn't they? Because it wouldn't draw the attention of the biggest monument that, uh, on the earth, you know, that, that's only one of the seven wonders in the ancient world still standing. That draws people there. 
And so they hit it. They chose to hit it that way. They probably, I think, you know, before the flood, they were probably splitting the atom. The, tr the, the technology from the ancient past is so tremendous. They could have given it to us in a way that other like a caveman, big building of stone. Like, wh what is that? You know, so so the point is the Great Pyramid's not the the the, the uh, uh, narrative you just gave, which is fairly common. Oh, you can you know, Flinders Pender says one where you it's like the the workmanship of of a jeweler on the scale of acres. Mm. So you hear things like that and you think, oh, you, you can't fit a paper through some of the joints. Well, you can fit a, a friggin' whole book through the whole, some of the joints, some of the joints are so sloppy and stuff. So the point is, it seems that's part of their intelligence. They knew what to make strong on the, on the anatomy to make it stay what it is, but the top being so crappy and took again, just look at the guy's video going up. You can see, you know, the sloppy work that's up there. Read Flinders Petri if you don't want to watch the eight minute video of the recent guy that climbed it. And so so that, that's the first thing I'd say to what you're saying. It's the the contrary narrative to how, the parts of it that are really just use ingenuity to get it up there big and strong. As a matter of fact, when they say, you know, one of the things the, the people argument that the ancient high tech people use where it couldn't have been built by Khufu because you would have had to lay a block like every second for 20 years or something. No, that's based on the calculation that Wikipedia, everybody says there's 2.3 million blocks in the Great Pyramid. No, there's not. There's not that many blocks in there. There isn't, you know, and uh, a lot of them are, are just, uh, you know, the average size is, is uh, much smaller. The bottom ones are so big, you led to believe if you calculated the number of blocks would be in the Great Pyramid based on the large ones that are at the bottom, you'd probably get like 700,000. The ones on the bottom are huge. They're huge. And so you look at that, you figure the whole pyramid's like that. And only the, only the bottom two courses are huge like that. The 35th is a little bit bigger. You know, some of, some of the other courses, that they sort of vary. There's a whole science and revelation in that about the varying widths of the courses that I, that I could go into. Academic papers have been written about it too. But the point is that, that, uh, there's a lot less than 2.3 million. And so you don't, and, and if you, Peter James inside the pyramid, a lot of fill in there, you don't need all those years to explain this perfect, you can't even put a piece of paper through the crack. Oh, yes, you can, and a whole bunch of them, but some of them you can. So they showed, in answer to your question now, they showed that they had a tremendous ability to sharpen uh, uh, the sides of uh, limestone like it was steel and fit together two huge limestone blocks where there's almost no, you can't even fit a piece of paper between there. Yes, they showed they had that capability, but that's not throughout the pyramid. That's the point. I love it. And you're right. If there are much less blocks in it, then that would alter the timeline. That would make it more plausible that the Egyptian culture itself was just that advanced, that they could maintain and construct these types of things within a reasonable time frame, because that's the argument, exactly like what you just said, the amount of blocks, if you're taking it as a solid structure, minus the voids and cavities on the inside, but then also that they were using, you know, these copper chisels, and it was just a very, we, a lot of people like to say that they were just too primitive, and that's why you get the aliens and stuff like that. I know you're a big yeah. proponent that it was built by aliens, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so, it, it seems that um, with with all the advancements, with science, with the new way that we're going, with all the answers that we're getting with this kind of stuff, do you find that there's any solid answers that will kind of unify all of these theories? Because there seems to be such disparate examples in history, in geology, it, with the work of Robert Schock, which I definitely want to talk to you about, Dr. Anthony West and Robert Schock here in a minute, what they did with the uh, the Sphinx. But with all of this, do you think that there will finally be a unified idea about how these things were built? Or do you think that the ancients just built them to be mysterious? Well, I'm working on a, a video right now. Uh, I recently had a little communication with uh, Ben from Uncharted X, and he's one of the leaders in the ancient high tech movement. And, uh, and I'm trying to bring together uh, the, the two different viewpoints, the, they, Ben and those guys always refer to the mainstream, you know, he had Graham Hancock, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. he did just did like an hour program with Graham Hancock, who's definitely the grandfather, you know, the patriarch of the uh, al alternative uh, people. And so uh, Gra Graham mentioned a bunch of times just the other day in that interview, the mainstream, the mainstream. And so I'm looking at the mainstream and the arguments that I heard Graham Hancock and Ben just make. And I'm, I'm trying to put those together 
to show uh, what I think is a real resolution. But here, but my answer to your question is no, I don't think there'll be because they won't like my resolution. I mm. do think it resolves exactly all the words that are said. I really do. I think I'll show that I can resolve the words, but they still won't buy it. So, so no, be just because of the, the, the limitation of human personality, it won't be able to be done and, and the different perceptions that people have. But, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my part to, to try and, uh, you know, show what resolution can, can be brought there. Because I do consider myself in the middle, in the, in the, not in the middle, but I'm eclectic. So I'll draw from anywhere. I'll draw from anywhere where somebody's uh, expressing meaning. I'll listen. You know, and, uh, and, I, and I don't think we have to immediately default uh, to, to hate. It's like it's an us versus them. Okay. Like, for, for instance, I, I told uh, Ben, you know, I've been with uh, Chris Dunn who's one of the you know, academic leaders because he's written a couple books, textbooks. He, I lived in Illinois. I don't now. I live in Tennessee now, but he lived in Illinois. I said, let's get together, Chris. I spent a day with him. We had a nice time. We have totally different views. Yeah. Yusuf Awan, he's going, he goes with all those guys. Any XD, he's always, his dad was a, you know, a leader of the ancient Kemet school and stuff. I, I, I invited uh, uh, him, Yusuf, into the Great Pyramid. The last time I paid for a private entrance, you know, and I let him talk to my people. We have completely different views. So the point is, I got along with Yusuf, you know, I mean, I got along with Chris Dunn. We don't have to hate each other just because we have different views. It's like, get over that. What is that? That is so old school. What do you, you know, I mean, I mean, yeah, it's old school, but it's still what, what the world runs on, you know? So it, it's unfortunate that there has to be this, okay, you got a different opinion. So now that we established that, let's keep talking. I mean, you know, it's, I, I love this because you're not on team Chris Dunn. You're not on team Zahi Huas. You're on team Larry Paul. And you pull yeah. from all of these ideas, which I think is wonderful. And it seems to be that a lot of people like like Graham Hancock, which I love his work. I love his America before he does a wonderful job. He's got some very interesting perspectives, especially on timelines of uh, like the end of the Younger Dryas uh, with Randall Carlson. They do a lot of work on this with the giant impact theory, uh, which again relates to the age of the Sphinx, which is very interesting. So uh, with with all of this stuff going on with the, your research in particular, what are some of the elements that you were able to say, you know what, the established or the mainstream in air quotes, as they've called it, and then some of these alternative theories, where does the Venn diagram overlap that you have found? That, uh, that both sides don't see something. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, okay, so... Yeah, I just heard, you know, Graham and them, okay, why doesn't, you know, the mainstream see our side? Well, here's their side. These tool marks means there had to be an ancient technology. But what Mark Lehner said, I heard him mention, in, in, he is, he's from North, North Dakota, so some small TV station interviewed their, their, their hero returned home. So it was a small circulation TV interview that Mark Lehner had up in North Dakota. But he, he said, he mentioned Graham Hancock, Robert Baval, Robert Schock. He mentioned their names and saying that they're challenged him. He says, the thing is, I don't find that. In other words, I've sifted more sand in Giza than anybody else. And he uses the, the to me, the boring, slow moving, but still very scientifically respectable, sifting through every bit of sand. And we label this little coin we got and we put it in a box over here. He's gone through everything. And you know what? I don't find any evidence for what you guys are talking about. Even with so, the water so, on the Sphinx, the enclosure? Well, uh, yeah, that, that, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about where they say okay. that the, these markings, like uh, a, a drill hole in granite, means there had to be ancient high technology but then mark they, they find saying, drill bits no they've not found drill bits they i mean in what the sense Chris of Dunn talking about about the drill bit with actual scoring going around it because i have seen a presentation well, yeah you, you need to watch i hate to say it but watch uh alan on sacred geometry decoded he has a video about chris has done core claim and he shows how he just as a layman in Australia, he went to some granite guys, give me some granite. They're making fun of, you know, of how you guys can't do this. And he showed how he could get granite perfectly level himself, not by his father wasn't a Mason. He's not a Mason by, by two weeks of doing this. He was able to do drill 
core holes, like Chris Dunn says, could only be done with, you know, high tech tools or something. He does very simply in the means available to ancient. So it's a great debunking of that, that, that whole idea. And I, I hate to say that to Chris, but I, I, I'm sorry. I listened to sacred geometry decoded. So in other words, you can draw different conclusions about what those marks indicate. Oh, those had to be diamond technology. Those had to be a modern you know, lathe press or something. And, and sacred geometry decoded says, no, <laughs> so you can do that by hand now. This is, so, you know, this is another interesting yeah. argument with it because they, everybody always says, or you hear a ubiquitous term saying that uh, we couldn't do this today. You know, that's one of the big things. We, could, we couldn't even do it with all of our modern technology. Well, maybe it's not the technology that was the issue. Maybe it's the technique. It was the knowledge. It was the skill. Well, it's not the technique. I, I just said that in, in, in response to one of these videos. I said, people say we couldn't build the Great Pyramid today. Are you serious? We could totally build the Great Pyramid today. We're just not going to because there's no money in it. Right. We build right. we build the, the Sears Tower because there's a bunch of commercial real estate sold in there. We build a building because there's the Dubai Tower. You think, of course, they made money on that, the, the amount it cost to live in there. Mm. So building the Great Pyramid wouldn't bring any money, so we wouldn't build it. Then that says something about the Egyptians because you know what? They didn't make any money on it either. I mean, there was no money to be made. They did it out, out of, you know, of love and fear of the Pharaoh and, and, uh, and, and the God. I mean, it was like an act of, it's like a way we don't live. We don't live in, in daily, like, look at the Egyptian prayers. They're constantly thinking, you know, what's my life like in the overall scheme of making it to the next life? You know, their whole thing about mummy, their whole societal focus was on the next life. Ours isn't. Look at the 10 o'clock news. Yeah. And so, you know, they built the Great Pyramid. You know, you know and, we would we would to say we couldn't is ridiculous. Really? Are you going to say that? And you're going to really think we couldn't build the Great Pyramid day? You've seen machines that we have, engineers we have. Oh, come on. Of course we could build the Great Pyramid. Don't be silly. <laughs> we yeah. just won't. And there you go. And that's another thing that I want to ask you about. So there are a couple of alternate theory. And this is one of the things about the pyramids, especially, man, is that they're so mysterious. There are so many theories about how they were constructed, what they were for. So let's talk motive real quick. Uh, if you are talking motive, there's a couple of different explanations for this now. And you can probably settle this for all of us. I have heard that there are and I want to talk about um, what's his name? Hang on one second. Uh, Howard Howard Weiss here in just a second, what he found up in the relief chambers. But to, to go back to motive real quick, what, what I've heard a lot, and there's been a lot of study done on the motives or the purpose behind the pyramids. Now, what a lot of people say is that there's no inscriptions in the pyramids, there's no carvings, and there was no mummies ever found. Therefore, it, it totally throws out the window the fact that they were utilized for tombs. Now, they found a box in there with, like you said, no sarcophagus lid, but there's also some resonant chamber type qualities that um, I know Edgar Casey and there's some mysticism elements to this. You, you've heard of the uh, Crowley stuff about him going in there and opening portals to demons and things like that. All of these things are, are interesting. They're fun bedtime stories. There's also another theory about that they were power plants, that there was piezoelectricity occurring due to the aquifers underneath. And you find this with a lot of pyramids globally, uh, again, from this allegedly unconnected society that they build these things over aquifers and there's an actual purpose between the of them having to produce power for a civilization then you look at things like what they found inside of one of the pyramids or one of the tombs uh, i believe in lexor with the uh, bulb there's like a bulb inscription and it looks like a light bulb uh, with a filament in it and everything how would they have light bulbs if they needed power? Then you look at things like the Baghdad batteries. I think that there's a lot about this ancient culture and what they were able to do technologically that was a little bit mentally out of the scope for what we understand, but that they had some great knowledge as far as being able to produce this kind of stuff. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, my standard answer since, you know, uh, is that, you know what, it might have been a power plant, but it's not now. And I say that because I, one of the purposes it was always there because you know what I do think it was a, a power plan I do think and if it wasn't a power plant it was meant to be a model that people could study it and learn how to build a power plant mm. you know Tesla etc in other words I because you can't prove if it was or it wasn't but the the the, the schematics that people make that say it could have been yeah it could have been even Chris Dunn you know the things you would have to have for what he says to be true. There is absolutely no evidence anywhere of the stuff he's saying had to be there. He was hoping that those little uh, the, the things that looked like uh, you know, copper electrodes on the doors inside the uh, air shafts 
you know, would, would give proof, but all the wiring and the chemicals and stuff you'd have to have for Chris Dunn's the thing. And, and then of course, Gattenbrink, when he studied the chef, said there's no way they could hold water, any liquid or anything, because there's all kinds of holes in them. So, so there, there's no, just no proof. But I think Chris Dunn has a great idea. He shows what the pyramid seems to be a schematic for this power plant. And I do think that could be one of the purposes of the Great Pyramid. I don't think it was a power plant, at least the evidence of all the stuff that would have to be there that Chris Dunn says would have to be there. It's not there. It just isn't, Chris. It's not. Hmm. But it still could be a model for that. So the Great Pyramid has all kinds of purposes. That's why it's so amazing. But its main purpose was symbolic. And that's why I always say it might have been a power plant at one time, but it's not now. So I want to study it for what it still is. It was symbolic when it was built and it still can be studied for that. Now it was a power plant when it was built. Oh, but it's not now. So that's not a real good power plant. If it doesn't last until now, see what about perpetual power? What about how smart they are? Well, how, if they were so smart, how couldn't they make one that would last beyond into the age of the 21st century skeptical world that could show us all how it was done. They probably were smart enough to have done that, but they didn't. It's not a power plant now. It isn't. Okay. So, so I like to work with what it is. It's a symbolic. And of course, the ancient legends about it, go, go, they're, they're in the Muslim world. They're in, uh, you know, the ancient Egypt. They're, uh, they're, they're in legends from the ancient past are that Enoch was going to build, you know, two, two stone pillars. And they would contain the, the knowledge of science at the time, the, the high level of science. And they would also be warnings for future catastrophes. Mm. And I believe the Great Pyramid is that, one of the pillars of Enoch. It's got all the wisdom. So, so even though the Egyptians built it, you know, Herodotus says that it was Philitus who got the ear of Khufu, and all the Egyptians, Herodotus was told, believed that that person was the architect of the Great Pyramid. So the Romans were great builders. They mimicked the Greeks. The Romans could build, but they might have had plans that go back to, you know, Aristotle or, you know, even, you know, some, somebody from ancient Egypt. So, so the Egyptians were great builders, but I think the plans, the wisdom that people want to attribute these things to previous cultures, because there is a wisdom that the Egyptians use that's, that's embedded in there, but it's not necessarily from the Egyptians. They were the builders. And so I, I do think that that, that fits the idea that it was Enoch's pillar that it encoded, like, for instance, you know, uh, uh, Carl Sagan would say, well, put the fine structure constant. If you're going to send a, you know, a robot out into space and try and show people we know what we're doing, well, use the fine structure constant, which is this mysterious God number, you know, that, that atomic physicists talk about. Well, as perhaps you saw, I did a recent program out of uh, the fine structure constant is in the King's chamber. It is. It, it plainly is. It's so obvious. It's there. So they, the fine structure constant, which is supposedly a, you know, a culmination of all the atomics theorists, you know, Fermi, name them all, you know, the, you know, Einstein, and now we finally get the fine structure constant. Oh, guess what? It's in, it's in the King's chamber. So, so there you've got what Carl Sagan said we should do. Look, and they did to us. They said, "Hi, we know about the fine structure constant." Okay, and and so the Egyptians built that into they were great builders to be able to build it there but i think the knowledge of the fine structure constant goes back before the egyptians it goes back to probably enoch and, and the ancient patriarchs Th that, that would be the same wisdom that went into this monolithic uh, you know circle of the earth you're talking about all that that's built into all these ancient monuments it's an ancient wisdom and uh and the, the building technique is an ancient or, or ancient passing downs too but I think the, the physics and, and the geometry and the arithmetic is even older. Man, I love this. You know, and it, it seems like there's so much evidence out there that can be interpreted one way or another. And it seems like if you, no matter what the evidence reveals, because like Chris Dunn says, and I, I think it's his theory about the, the chemical composition of the rocks used, of the blocks that were used, create this sort of piezoelectricity. And they demonstrated uh, the same thing as demonstrated by a little, little quartz crystal in your watch. The, the blocks have the same property and therefore they kind of break things down from that way. But yes, there, there does seem to be just a mass puzzle here. It's like, okay, just go figure this thing out. And the way that it's laid out, you know, when we look at the Orion connection, but, but this Orion connection is found globally with all kinds of things, with churches, with other monoliths that were found from other civilizations all across the world. So this lends to the idea, of course, the construction of 
pyramids in other places, period. That, that idea that says that there was a global civilization or an ancient high technology that was being utilized at this time is the reason that we see all these things that are connected. Uh, the, even the deal about how they have a door and two windows, uh, this thing in uh, Petra, and, and then it's found over in Cusco as well. These interconnected type of ideas, not only the Orion connection, the fact that pyramids were built anyway. Do you think that there was an ancient global civilization that was very high technology and interconnected? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's that's one of the, and of course, the way that I, I differ from others on that is that I absolutely, there is no question that there was, you know, there's no question. And so that's a case where the mainstream is, you know, Yes. blinded okay yes. because there was there plainly was but that doesn't mean that they built the great pyramid see that's the automatic jump to judgment because there was an ancient high tech civilization therefore they had to have built the great pyramid no they you know I, they might have built other things i don't know i'm not a student of gobeki tepli I, I just focus on egypt and giza there's enough to keep me occupied until i die that's where that's where my focus is it's it's the american institute for pyramid research but right. but the i say right there the focus is egypt okay and so uh you know, uh, I, I just think that uh, that that it was built by the Egyptians, but the wisdom that's in that ain't those ancient high tech civilizations from the past and stuff, it, it worked its way in there, too. So, it, again, I, I do believe there was. And, and that's an explanation for another day. Uh, I'm working on a, a video on that right now. But, uh, you know, let me let me jump to something else, because you asked me about, uh, you know, the, the, you know, using modern technology, you know, doing first of all, the studies I do, you can't use a tape measure on the Giza Plateau. If you're, if you're a tourist, you can get a camera out, you can do things. And so I know because I've been arrested before, you know, and, and I learned, I said, well, there's no signs that, you know, look at that guy's using the camera. I'm using the tape measure. What? No, you can't do that. That's okay. And so the, the measurements I take have to be, you know, they have to be, you know, like I'm, I, 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 the way I measure an angle, I use, we often just use the iPhone or use uh, something else that can you know, that, that's got a magnetic, you know, may, maybe better than what's in the in the iPhone. But I'm I'm so I'm 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 hiding the fact that I'm taking that measurement, you know. So yeah, that's one of the reasons that they follow me because I say things like this and then they hear about it and they do. As a matter of fact, the, when I had the private entrance the last time, my my tour guide, uh, my connection in Egypt uh, told me that uh, everybody knows me at antiquities, and they're all hoping that they don't get me. Because somebody from antiquities is always signed, assigned to someone who's been given access to the, the pyramid and a private entrance. They don't want to be with me because I'm going to do something and then they're going to get in trouble because he did it while I, I was under their <laughs> watch. watch I'm, yeah. I'm always trying to beat the, you know, I mean, I'm sorry. That's why I say I'm the real Indiana Jones. You know, the, the, he's, that's fiction, but I'm real. Like, I really do that stuff. And it's, why, why? Because it's intellectual curiosity. It's because I know just what you've alluded to and everything you said. This is a puzzle that was placed there to be solved. Yes. There is a puzzle. When you look at a crossword puzzle in the New York Times, do you think that was just randomly put together? Someone spent time putting that together and you can only solve it by spending time thinking about it. what has six letters and you know is the same as the word lamb. You got to do that, okay? So I know that there is encoded wisdom here and I'm trying to find it. So if I got to kind of hide a tape measure or something, I'm going to do it. You know, and so I mean and so, so the, that's the first point. You can't you really do what I'm doing, but you, there are ways to do it. You know, so I do it the ways that I can, you know, that, where it does, you know, it, you can't prove, hey, what do you mind? I'm taking pictures. This is my phone. You can't take my phone. I'm taking pictures like everybody else, you know? So, so, so then when I, then I take it to what truly are high tech tools, for instance, this is my recent discoveries and I still can't believe I discovered this and this is going to have to get bigger because other people are going to see this. It's, I did a series of videos about the Holy Shaft. Mm -hmm. Now we'll see if that name stands because, you know, the King's chamber, it's not really a King's chamber, but that's the name they use in the, the Queen's chamber. Well, it's not really a Queen's chamber, but that sticks the trial passages. They're not really the trial passages. Mark Lehner calls them the replica passages. And there's a whole story there. Okay. So holy shaft, someone's going to have to name because there's this, this, this uh, shaft I found that's on the Giza plateau that no one notices. It's unobtrusive. It's nothing. And it's connected to everything. It is like, it is like, the 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 pineal gland you know how, how sexy is the pineal gland if you just look at it i mean there's a sloppy little bladder there's an ugly little lizard you know i mean how how sexy does the pineal? and that, so i found this little and you know what what i found is through the modern technology we're talking about you can measure things on google earth and i'm led to believe it's a pretty accurate measurement because the gps 
that use that uses that measurement is the same one that keeps the car going 100 miles, well, 70 miles an hour on a California highway that has no driver in it, staying about this far apart from the car that's coming the other way. So the same technology that keeps the driverless car from hitting everything is the same GPS technology that Google Earth uses when I'm drawing their little line across there to tell me it's 59 inches, it's 58 feet, it's 47 meters. That's, I'm connected to that same massive technology, right? So what I found is from the holy shaft, it's an even 100 feet to almost everything. Wow. Now, you could cherry pick a little bit. Like if I, if I say, well, I'm going to measure from my hat to stay you're sitting next to me, from my hat to your head. Well, I could measure from this part of my hat over to you. I could measure from this part of my hat over you. Get a little different. But given, the, given that fudge factor, First of all, take into account that I said, I am going to avoid that by taking the center of the holy shaft. So all my measurements are taken from the center. So that cuts down any fudge factor from that point. But now when I'm going to the Sphinx, so I could touch the Sphinx's tail, I could touch his head. So I want to touch a part of the Sphinx that's like, you know, that's the Sphinx, okay? Yeah. And so I found that the holy shaft is almost an exact 100 feet from everything, the trial passages. Okay, you know, I mean, name name any feature you're aware of on the Giza Plateau, the uh, the Osiris shaft that yeah. Brian Foster and everybody goes to. You spend you spend the big money to take the expensive tour, and now you go down to you know hundreds of feet below the Giza Plateau. It's exactly 200 feet from the Holy Shaft. I mean, every major thing that is incredible. And, I, and the way I first found it, I, I discovered what I called the holy circle. I, I found in Will Wire, a uh, good graphics friend of mine, we found the circle that goes around that holy center, that holy shaft. It's exactly 888 feet to the southeast corner of Khufu. It's exactly 888 feet to the Sphinx. It's exactly 888 feet to the center of Ken Kawes, And it's exactly 888 feet directly west, touching the Khafre Pyramid. What are the chances? And I did, I did it on Google Earth too. I, I only, I, I first realized that the, you know this was there, but then it's exactly 888 feet, and that's what led me to think, well, it's if it's exactly 888 feet to those four major monuments on the Giza Plateau, and it's plainly the center point. I wonder what else it might be connected to, and that led me to do this thing, and I've done a couple programs on it, where it's unbelievable. So, so people are going to have to. It's going to be very hard to say that's coincidence, that chance he cherry picked that. Uh uh, do it yourself. Look what I did. That's a, that's a major discovery. And so, one of the things that came at me, which I've never answered yet, is you saying the Egyptians knew feet because they built the pyramid in royal cubits, uh, the second of the seven to 11 second, and, and they built it in royal cubits. As a matter of fact, oftentimes when I'm trying to figure something out, you know, the measurements will be given me of this pyramid in meters. You know, the, the, the Egyptologists who studied it measured it in meters. So I will convert them to royal cubits. And when I come to even numbers, I know I'm on to something mm. because the Egyptians did build with royal cubits. Well, long story short, what Robert Grant and Alan Green and many others have shown, the meter, the foot, and the cubit are aboriginal. They're connected ontologically you know, and I, I could say more about that, but, but, and I just saw Robert Grant answer somebody plainly, the meter is used in the King's chamber. And he, and he gives examples. It's exactly, I think, uh, you know, 314 uh, meters around three, in other words, 3.1415, it's pi, yeah. pi yeah. meters around the, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all kinds of examples you can show. The people who are going to say, no, it can't be, no, it can't be, are going to really have to start fighting a lot of evidence. And so for me, it's easy to say there's an aboriginal connection, and I could explain it geometrically and stuff too. For instance, you take a one meter pendulum, just take a one meter pendulum. So here's exactly one meter, the modern meter, swing it at 30 degrees. It swings out exactly pi over six, because it's 30 degrees out of a 360 circle, pi over six, which is exactly one royal cubit. So one meter swung at 30 degrees, swings out an arc of exactly one royal cubit. And it takes, by the way, exactly one second. So now it's connected to time and the rotation of the earth. So uh -huh. you don't have to go far. You don't have to go far to show an ontological <laughs> aboriginal connection to cubit meter foot. So 
I, I haven't really answered that yet to the people that say, you're saying the Egyptians knew the foot. And I'm saying there's a tremendous intelligence in operation here, people. I'm not saying what the Egyptians knew, because I think it's more than them. But there's a tremendous intelligence at play here. Okay. Yeah. Just mind blowing. So just for clarity, what is the foot uh, in comparison to the cubit? What's the difference size wise? Uh, to, uh, what I always use, and then this is going to depend if you just go, you know, uh, pi over six, it's 20.6 inches in a royal cubit. Okay. So it's just shy of a foot. Well, 20.6 oh, inches, inches for in a, one cubit. In, in a royal oh, okay. Just shy so of two feet. I, I, didn't, okay. I didn't give you a foot royal cubit connection, I gave you an inch royal cubic connection i mean you can do the conversion just divide by 12 or you know that's right okay and, yes sir okay yes. two okay uh you know what i love about the uh shaft that you're talking about is is that this feels very indiana jones doesn't it this feels very <laughs> there is a mystery here uh and you found it in a very indescript way while other people are looking at the the forest you're you're seeing the trees you're you're looking at the other people see the Great Pyramid, they, their focus goes there. But it's kind of the Indiana Jones connection in my mind is the uh, Holy Grail. Whenever he goes in to pick the Grail, it's not this ornate, beautiful thing. It's this crappy little cup over here. That's what, of course, it would have been. Yeah. Just like your, yeah. your, your great shaft. That, that is sort of the key to unlocking all the mysteries around it. It's very indescript. It's very out of the way. There's no neon signs pointing towards it. But you found it. That is and Indiana you, Jones. You, you know what really excites me along those lines, Brandon? We just talked about how yesterday or today, depending on how you count the, the, where the, the difference in time between Egypt and here, they moved the, the Khufu boat from, uh, the, uh, from the Giza Plateau to the New Gem Museum. Well, one of the reasons they did that, they said, because they weren't going to, the whole point was that, you know, there were two boats found there right next to each other. The, the current solar boat pit that was just moved, that's on the east of the south side. But there was another boat found on the west part of the south side. That was the one that they, that uh, Bob Breyer, the Egyptologist, was working on reconstructing and doing a video about it. And then they were going to take that one to the gym. So it'd be one at the gym and one left at Giza. So the reason they decided to take both of them one of the reasons that antiquity stated was because they, that side of the pyramid has been off limits to everybody. And they went because they're building tourism. They want people. I'm so excited because I have, I, one of my marks is I've learned to start interpreting this language of the markings on the North and the East side. Now the South side is going to be open to me. I'll be able to go in there and find marks that have in the, in the providence of things and the synchronicity of things are just now going to be open. So when I go in October, that's going to be one of the places where I spend a lot of time because I'm assuming that they'll have moved the, the, uh, the, the uh, foundations and stuff to that museum and moved it out so they can let tourist traffic go in there. Because again, that's one of their stated goals. I wouldn't have thought in the past that wouldn't have been a high goal of antiquities to let people at the pyramid. That's almost antithetical to the way they used to think. But there's a new thinking. Think about this. The Egyptian government did the strange and wonderful thing of combining two departments of state that nobody else combines. You've got on one hand, you've got uh, the, the uh, antiquities sifting through every grain of sand, this conservative science, you know, don't give too much, you know, don't let people see it, preserve the pyramid. And then on the other hand, you've, you've got, uh, you know, tourism. Hey, come to Egypt. It's the greatest place in the world. Yes. So you've got the hype of tourism. They combined those two departments. And so now tourism and antiquities are the same department. So what's happening is this thing is taken over now. Antiquities used to be this concern. We can't. Zahi Awas used to say, don't let people in the Great Pyramid. We'll just have a museum outside and they'll see it virtually. No, no, don't do that. You know, and so now that they've done, they want people to come. They want people to experience Egypt. And so they want them to walk on the south side of the pyramid. So they're probably going to move all their foundations and stuff out of there. So people, so the traffic can flow around the south side of the pyramid. So that's great. I'm wow. looking forward to, to looking at the marks that'll be left after they move those boat pits and stuff. That's so exciting. And we're going to keep up with you, man. Uh, we'll probably wrap it up here, but it was, tell me one more amazing thing. Like what, what it just blows your mind about this complex over there in Giza? Okay. Well, what, one thing, this is one of my discoveries with my friend, uh, Bob, uh, Bob Criley, who's a, an engineer is I discovered the Hemayinu template. Now it's named after the architect, of the great pyramid. I show his placement, his tomb is, is, it's so 
uh, just strategically located on the plateau and in relationship to the Great Pyramid. In many ways, he's showing I'm the architect of the Great Pyramid by what he did with the, with the measurements of his own tomb and the way it's lined up with the pyramid. So the Hemianu template is a 200 meter, 200 royal cubit square, a horizontal slice of the Great Pyramid. And I've discovered it. It's, it's a long story, but it's there. It's plain there. It's not my invention. It's, it's, it's meant to reveal things. It's this, again, horizontal slice, a theoretical slice, 200 royal cubit square. And one of the things I found out about it is that and, and 200 royal cubits is 104.7 meters. And 104.7 is an amazing number in terms of converting units and stuff, but it's 104.7. Okay, so what I found is <laughs> pi divided by the speed of light is 1.047. Oh, 1, 1. In other words, it's, it's, it's 1047 meters, but it's 200 royal cubits, 1047. Okay, so pi divided by the speed of light is 1047 at the 110 billion scale. Now, the reason I mention this, NASA scientists put together for the, the National uh, Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. They've got an outdoor exhibit so you can experience the size and feel of the solar system. So it's the, the, the sun is the same distance from Pluto, which is a 15 minute walk that way, to a 110 billionth scale. Mercury is proportionally, and size wise too, this size of the sun is a 110 billionth representation of the sun. So when earth is this big, it's a 110. So the NASA scientists are, have used the 110 billionth scale to make the solar system understandable to people walking down by the National Mall. Hemiunu, whose name means human, the architect of the Great Pyramid, pi over the speed of light is 1047 to the 110 billion scale. Oh my God, that is fascinating. As far as I know, I, as far as I know, I'm, you and me are the only people that know that because I did a YouTube video about it, but as you'll see, my YouTube channel is pretty small. It's hard to grow independent channels these days since the Logan Paul incident. And so not many people are going to know it. I just, but that's incredible. <laughs> a lot of people are about to know this, man. We have a global audience. I cannot wait to share this with everyone. And we will definitely have to have you back on. Uh, personal note, uh, just to add a little controversy here. Uh, it's a little on the nose, though, that his name means human. I mean, you would do that if you were an alien and your name was alien. You'd be like, no, 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 change his name to human. That'll throw him off, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And you know what I say? I don't know if his name means human. I've just yeah, learned I, that etymologically so many names that like Enoch is inch. I really believe the word inch comes from Enoch. He's the, according to legend, he's the father of metrology. So he was the original guy that meters cubits foot. So inch is encoded in his name. So I do think Enoch inch, him, you know, human, you know, if I'm wrong, oh well, who can prove wow. it? <laughs> I mean, and you know, with Enoch, that, that poor guy, I mean, if his name was inch, that sucks. Uh, you know, I know oh, Enoch, Enoch and Inch are the same thing because there's no vowels anciently. So E N, you know, C. Is, yes. Or, or N N C H, I should say. N C H is Enoch and it's Inch, no vowels. I was making a dumb joke about male insecurity. It's okay. <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah, yeah. You know what? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Larry, you are incredible. I, I would love to have you back on. You're going to be my resident uh, Egyptologist. So we'll, we'll uh, <laughs> consult with you with any new discoveries. Please come back anytime, my friend. You are absolutely fantastic. If you I don't mind, add to it. Whoa. Just a disclaimer, though, just so people know, I'm not an Egyptologist, even though I presented at each Egyptological conferences. My my degrees are in theology, education, and political science, and so I don't. Those are not fields that Egyptologists. You know, I'm not Near Eastern languages, that kind of thing. So I don't call myself an Egyptologist, but I'm certainly an independent researcher. Yes. You're humble and we adore you for that. We all, you're the expert though. Uh, we're going to come to you for this in the future. So uh, Larry, if you don't mind, just tell the folks where they can find you. I'll be linking all of this in the show notes as well. And then we'll, uh, we'll bid you adieu for the okay. day. Yeah. Uh, Instagram, it's at Sage Silent and uh, YouTube. Uh, if you did as one word, the Great Pyramid AIP, because it's the American Institute of Pyramid Research. So the you know, Great Pyramid is too many. There's too many people that have that. So the Great Pyramid AIP, and you'll find my channel. And uh, for, uh, uh, what else do I give you? Uh, my, oh, my website, uh, greatpyramid.org. You got you the, know, I should have, 
I should have got .com because I was in the infancy. I could have got any name I wanted to back then, you know, but I got .org because I'm a not-for-profit. The great, the American Institute for Pyramid Research is a, is a registered not-for-profit corporation uh, in Tennessee. And so .org is the appropriate, you know, the appropriate thing. So greatpyramid.org. Wow. Well, and I know that my wife are gonna, and I are going to be joining you on one of these trips. We've got to do this. It's it's on my bucket list. And now I've got somebody I couldn't imagine walking around there with anybody else other than you. So thank you so much for your time, my friend. This is 